Welcome to Spotlight. Today, we have a very, very special guest. My name is Belinda Lee, and I am your host. So today, we have a very special guest. Like I said, it is a doctor. We have a doctor in the house. Dr. Maria Nicolopolo, and this woman takes care of the very special part of a woman. Dr. Maria, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So nice to have somebody who has um, specialized in the area of female. This show is about actually showing the females or the audience out there what amazing things can a female accomplish. But not only that, you're actually emphasizing your work around us. So tell us, why, why gynecologist? Well, uh, Miss Lee, this is a long story. It didn't start like a gynecology in the beginning. I loved medicine since I was four years old. And my whole life since then has been about people and helping people and taking care of their health needs. So when I grew up and I graduated from college, I went to medical school, graduated medical school, and then I wanted to do heart surgery. Mm. But one of my professors advised me, and very well, that a young girl of 25 and being a heart surgeon, there will be very few people that would give trust in me. So since I loved surgery, I went to plastic surgery. And then I said, well, I love delivering babies. So why don't I do obstetrics and gynecology, where obstetrics has delivering of the babies and gynecology has taken care of all women's needs. So that's how I lined up with gynecology. And I have never regretted, not even for a minute. How many years have you been doing this? Over 35 years. 35 Well, years. I started when I was 12, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> you look beautiful. And thank, thank you, you for everything that you do for us females. How many babies have you delivered? That would be an interesting question. Thousands. I Thousands don't know. Thousands of babies. Oh, wow. Really, I lost count. I used to count them when I started, <laughs> but then you lose count. My goodness. I'm I mean, blessed. I feel endless. blessed. And uh, in what countries do you deliver these babies? I delivered babies in the United States, England, Greece. Uh, I delivered the baby on a flight. I delivered babies in well, Africa. Hold on for a second. Hold on for a second. Let's talk about that. You deliver a baby on a flight. Now, yes. how did that happen? Well, actually, you know, by law, you're not allowed to travel during the last uh, month of your... Uh, the trimester. Uh, yeah. Yes, exactly. Well, it's less than a trimester oh, now. It's okay. just a month, a month and a half before your due date. Mm -hmm. But this lady has hidden it. Oh. So it wasn't that it came unexpectedly. She was at her due date. So with the flight taking off and the difference in pressure, uh, her water broke and I had to deliver the baby on the flight. She must be so lucky to have you, who is a gynecologist, on the plane as well. Yeah, they were calling for a doctor and then I saw two, three people going and then they still kept on asking for a doctor. So I said, well, maybe it's more urgent. They need more hands. And I went and they said, what? The specialty are you? I said, I'm an obstetrician and gynecologist. Says, this is what we need. She's delivering. She's having her baby. Oh so my that, it, and it what was flight such, was this? It was a flight going from New York to Europe. That's a long flight. It's a long flight. <laughs> we were on top of the ocean. There was no way they could land oh in any airport. So I had to do that. And it's okay. I mean, women in the old days, they used to, to deliver in the fields by themselves. Yes. And they had uh, friends to help them or midwives. So yeah. it's not a big deal. It's nature. We're just helping, giving a helping hand to nature. Most of the times, not at all times, because it can wow. get difficult. Wow, that is, to me, is, is astounding. It's just one of the most miraculous things that you're doing, because bringing life to earth and and that's, to you, it might be a piece of cake. It's like so easy. But to us, it's really miraculous. Thank you so much. So in layman's term, because not a lot of us understand medical terms, so mm -hmm. how would you describe your job to someone? I'm going to say, Dr. Marie is a gynecologist, and a lot of my audience is going to say, what is that? What do you do? Okay, gynecology deals with the reproductive system of a woman. The function, uh, the problems, we treat them, and we do surgeries. Mm -hmm. And the obstetric part deals with the well-being of the lady during pregnancy and delivery. Mm -hmm. 
So that's in a couple of words what it's all about. Now cosmetic or aesthetic gynecology is another part that has been developing the last 20 years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I'm very much interested in that because women always want to look their best. <laughs> and yes. there is also functional reasons for yes. aesthetic gynecology. We're going to cover that because I know that's one of your passions. So yes, we're going to go been. in depth of cosmetic gynecology. And uh, you, audience, are going to learn so much about it. So your work is about gynecologists, but what does it really entail, though? What are kind of the work you do on a daily basis? Okay, starting with prevention, which mm -hmm. I'm very much for it. Women should start seeing their gynecologist at a very early age. Mm -hmm. So we do checkups, mm -hmm. and then we give uh, diagnosis, we make diagnosis and treatment of many different ailments that have to do with either the genital organs, mm -hmm. fertility issues, uh, urology issues, um, sexually transmitted diseases. We do uh, cancer surgery. Uh, we do polycystic ovaries. We give treatment in menopause. So we take care of a woman from the time she's born, actually, mm -hmm. until the end of uh, times. Mm -hmm. So, well, more or less, I would say after adolescence is the age that we look at uh, women mm -hmm. because when they're babies, they go to a pediatrician. They don't very often come to us, but sometimes we have referrals from uh, pediatricians for babies that sure. have a problem and they have an issue in their female organs. Right. Now, I wanted to address one of the, the comments you made. You said women should actually start seeing a gynecologist at a fairly young age. Now, what is that age group? Okay, if they don't have a problem, uh, I think the age should be the, the day after they have their first intercourse. Okay. Okay, no matter how young or how right. old they are. Now, it happens many times that uh, young girls, adolescents, they mm -hmm. have problems, they have pains, they have discharge, so the mothers bring them to us much, mm -hmm. at a much earlier age. Right. It's not the first period they have, but the first intercourse. No, I think the first period, mothers can handle it. They can give the full story of how to deal <laughs> yeah. with that. Uh -huh. But sometimes, like, they can have PMS at mm -hmm. a young age. Mm -hmm. They can have abdominal pain due to a, an ovarian cyst. So in that right. case, we have ladies that bring their daughters at a much uh, younger right. age. Yeah. Now, I want to dive into that a little bit because uh, women do suffer a lot of uh, menstrual cramps we call that, and during uh, menstruation. Now, are those menstrual cramps, I know that this is going to relate to a lot of the audience that's asking, so I have that too as well, probably 9 out of 10 do. Um, what causes the menstrual cramps when a woman has their menstrual period? Well, actually, if you think about it, what, what is menstrual period? Is the cramping, the, the squeezing and unsqueezing of the uterus, so the endometrium lining of it can mm -hmm. come out, mm -hmm. right? So in... A lot of women, around 70%, there is always PMS problems. Mm -hmm. But in some cases, they're very light, and in other cases, they're severe. Mm -hmm. And that causes uh, physical pain, a lot of physical uh, difficulties during the time, or emotional even. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. PMS starts a few days, two, three days before the period, and it can last throughout the period, or it stops like two days after you get your period. And it's not the same every month. It's not the same in every woman. There could be times that you can have PMS, mm -hmm. and then for many years, it just disappears and then comes back again. I've seen a lot of cases, a lot of ladies, that their PMS is gone right after they have their babies. So we we should not expect PMS every month if we once experience it. Mm -hmm. And then on the other hand, we know it will go away. But in some women, it's debilitating. These days, mm -hmm. I remember from my personal experience, I used to go to the hospital and have an injection because my PMS pain was so horrific that mm -hmm. I could not function. Mm -hmm. And then later on, it got less and less. And when I had my babies delivered, it was gone like magic. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that... But there are ways that we can uh, deal with it. Like if it's not very severe, we can take a uh, brufen or an aspirin. Mm -hmm. We can put some pads on our uh, mm -hmm. abdomen or in the back. We can try to sleep and relax. 
Mm-hmm. Don't mm-hmm. smoke, don't have alcohol, right. and exercise. Exercise does wonders. So yes. it, it helps the blood to come out. And we've seen that PMS gets better, even better if it doesn't stop after delivery because the cervix has opened already, so it's an easier access of the blood to come out. Ah, So the cramping so gets... The uh, cramping has got to do with the flow of the blood. Yeah. I mean, how else? Uterus is an organ that has an internal lining. That mm-hmm. internal lining is getting thicker throughout the month, mm-hmm. and then it comes out, it sheds out during menstruation. In, you know, you, you mentioned something which is kind of true, because I do experience that younger women have PMS more than the older women do, mm-hmm. um, and especially after childbirth. Yeah. I don't hear it as much. I mean, yeah. um, if an older woman has PMS, then there is another problem. And what could is be that? due to fibroids, adenomyosis, uh, it, it could be cancer, it could be a lot of things. So we should deal with that as it comes. Now, you've been gynecologist for 35 years. What do you don't like about your job? Well, I love my job. Ah, I great love answer. my job. Great it's answer. everything I wanted to do in my life. And um, but if uh, someone will ask me for advice, if a young girl yes. comes for advice about her career, I would tell her to think twice. And why is that? Because of the long hours. Mm-hmm. Someone has to be really committed to become a gynecologist. Mm-hmm. There is a lot of satisfaction in our uh, specialty, but there are decisions you have to take in a moment. Mm-hmm. Then there are sad news that you have to deliver uh, it is not always good news yes it's a lot of happiness and a lot of satisfaction mm-hmm. when you uh, deliver a baby or when you treat a patient when you operate and you remove a fibroid or you deal with their problem you give them the right treatment but there is also some sad news uh, involved so you have to be committed and you have to be a strong person you have to be an understanding person you have to be a fun person to put your patients at ease because mm-hmm. we all know when you cross the door of your doctor, mm-hmm. you get all stressed out. You see the white coat, it stresses you more. Mm-hmm. You forget what you wanted to ask. You mm-hmm. forget what the doctor says. So the doctor has to put patients at ease, mm-hmm. try to take out their problems because a lot of times you forget and you have to ask the right question as a doctor and you have to reassure them. So this is not easy. And plus, you know, for a woman, uh, it's hard to have a family. Because if you really love your uh, career uh, decision and you become a gynecologist, Mm -hmm. you have to put in second place your family. Mm, Why do you say that? Because talking from my own experience Mm -hmm. again, There are times that I haven't seen my babies for a week because when the patient has a problem, she has no one else to help her but you. She trusts you, Mm -hmm. so you have to go. Your kids, they're okay sleeping at home or being with a nanny or being with a grandma, and they've been taken care of. Your patient is alone, Mm -hmm. so you have to put your patient as a priority. And that deprives you of some things. And plus, you know, when you have patients, at least in my dictionary, when I have a patient that sees pregnant and we get to know each other and she feels comfortable with me, I cannot leave her and go on holiday and have somebody else deliver her. So there has been times like for five years, as I recall, there was not one day off. There was no holiday. So you have to be really committed if you want to do gynecology. There is a lot of happy moments. There is big satisfaction. It's a good career move financially, and you have uh, respect of the community and all that. But on the other hand, unless you're committed, stay away from it as a woman. Now, with men, it's different. But as a woman... Which I'm going to lead you to the next question, and it's not about your your career and so forth, but more of uh, a female professional. What I'm hearing is a lot of guilt love guilt of not being with your family because you're so committed to your job. And um, is that normal? Like you said, it's different from men and women. So do you want to elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, because, you know, women, we are multitasked and we are mothers, we are housewives, we are career women. Mm -hmm. Where men, I'm not 
putting them down, but honestly, first is their career, and then it's their family and the kids. Not that they don't love them, but we're used in the society, and even our times, that we are becoming modern, and we're advancing, and our ideas change, and our mind opens. Still, men are not taking care of little kids. Mm -hmm. They're good mm -hmm. fathers, don't take me wrong, mm -hmm. but it's the mother that has the main responsibility. Mm -hmm. That's why men were always free to stay as long as they want in their office. And don't forget, in the old days, up until 30, 40 years ago, the majority of the gynecologists were men. Even right. though woman right. is the closest mm -hmm. to a female, so a female can open up when she has a woman sitting across from her. Men were the majority of the gynecologists. Mm -hmm. Well, now things change, thank God. But uh, <laughs> yeah, let's not forget that. It would be, um, that was my next question, is, is gynecology only for a woman's job or can, can there be men to as well? But you just answered that yeah. question, is that majority of the men are gynecologists. Uh, do you have special uh, patients that specially required or a request for a female gynecologist. Yes, yes, indeed. Especially in the hospital mm -hmm. uh, setting, we have uh, ladies, and especially in the country that we live in, uh, we have patients that they request not only a gynecology, a female gynecologist, but also a nursing staff gynecologist, an anesthesiologist oh, wow. that's yeah. uh, a female during surgery. And honestly, I do believe that mm -hmm. if there is a female gynecologist, understands better. Because mm -hmm. I understand when you're talking to me about PMS. I understand you when you're complaining about mood swings and night sweats and all that. Men, they read it in the books. We felt it in our soul and our yes. body. So that, that's we a big difference. We relate better. Oh, you relate exactly. better because you're actually a female body on itself. Yes, I do. I, just, I do see that. Now, I'm going to ask you a question that is um, female commonly asked. Okay. Uh, um, and and it's not a. Um, I'm just going to directly ask you this: <laughs> How do you best clean a female part? Good question. <laughs> very good question. It's a very personal question, a very intimate question. But I think there's a lot of people that ask that or wants to know, but they don't dare to ask that. You so. will be astounded by my answer. Mm -hmm. You don't clean it. <laughs> okay. And what do I mean by that? Don't take <laughs> me wrong. You might have to elaborate a little yes. bit on okay. that. Yes, okay, I will do that. But keep that. You don't clean it. At least you don't clean the inside. Mm -hmm. Okay, you can clean the outer uh, labia part and the pubical area with a mild soap, mm -hmm. but don't clean the inside of and the why, vagina. why is that? Because the vagina contains normal bacteria that's needed to fight inflammations and protect you. And by douching or inserting uh, or using some kind of strong soap that they advise you in the pharmacies, you kill that. So you kill your protection. And actually, it's that douching that you're doing and overcleaning it that can cause problems and uh -huh. even cancer. So I advise my patients, and I'm very strict with it, don't use anything to clean your vagina. Even if there is a light smell, it's okay. It's normal to have a smell. Mm -hmm. Our vagina area has a smell. It's on it. A really light musk uh, mm -hmm. musk smell, but it's normal. So don't take it away from you. The odor that you were talking about is a light is a light odor that the woman experience, and it's normal. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of women, they can't deal with it. They feel that it's they're dirty when they 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 have that odor. So how would you, if they come to the doctor with mm -hmm. that? Uh, uh, query and worry, uh, you just reassure them. Mm -hmm. If you examine them and you see that there is nothing wrong, they don't have bacterial vaginosis, they don't have trichomonas, they don't have any other bacteria there, you have to reassure them. Mm -hmm. And you have to explain to them that don't douche, don't do anything, you're clean enough, just use a mild soap when you shower. Mm -hmm. Or The best thing, I, I like organic things. A lot of uh, so do I. my advice to yeah. ladies is use organic stuff. Yeah medicine, wherever it goes and uh, through our uh, GI tract, it leaves something. Mm -hmm. So if you can avoid, don't overdo it with medicine. It's coming from a doctor. So I found chamomile. You know the chamomile, the, the flower, the, yes. the one with the yellow? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. 
If you boil chamomile and let it cool down, for God's sake, don't use it hot, and wash that area, this is the best antiseptic. Ah. And I advise that a lot to my ladies. Just clean, uh, use clean underwear. Yes. Change your pads during menstruation. Mm -hmm. Avoid the tampons as much as you can. Why is that? Well, this is common sense. If the blood is coming out, it needs to come out of your vagina. Otherwise, the longer it stays there, the more dangerous it becomes of getting you an infection. So tampon, you don't go to the bathroom and change it every five minutes. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. So I think it's best, even though the big companies, they say, no, no, they're fine. You know, the, Well, from a woman's perspective and from a medical point of view, mm -hmm. I really don't like uh, tampons. And that's the simple reason. You can get endometriosis from mm -hmm. it. You can get a lot of uh, bacteria. So you can use it once in a while when you want to wear your white tight pants. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. don't do it on an everyday basis every don't, month. It, it's not the sold, sold tool that you use when you're yeah. having your menstruation. Yeah. I think a exactly. lot of girls are going that way because it's so easy and so clean. Clean and, and convenient uh, and comfortable. Inconvenient. Yeah. And a lot of them do, you know, they're exercising. They go, this is perfect. Yeah. Um, but I see your point is that if the blood's got to flow out, it's got to flow out. Exactly. It's, there, it's flowing out for a reason. Exactly. Right. That's why sometimes it's not the tampon's uh, fault, but sometimes at the end of our period or after uh, sleep, a night's sleep, we see that mm -hmm. the blood turning black. Yes, that's there is right. nothing yeah. wrong with it. Yeah. Black is that blood clotting? means or clotting. It means it stayed inside the vagina longer, and that's why it mm -hmm. turns with the oxygen. It gets uh, more solid and turns color. That's all. Don't be scared if you mm -hmm. see black coming out. Right. If you see black coming out throughout your period, then I would worry about it. Right, right. And uh, going back to your question, I think a little bit of, of smell, like I said, it's normal. Mm -hmm. But then when you have this fissy odor mm -hmm. or you see uh, color changing of your natural fluids, mm -hmm. because we do have natural fluids, mm -hmm. we need them uh, while we're having intercourse. You know, they, they help a lot. So we can have white fluid that doesn't smell like fish, which is normal, but when they turn to yellow or green, then immediately you have to go to your doctor because it shows that there is a bacterial infection mm -hmm. there. Mood swings. Mood swings. Mood. Women have a heck of a lot of it. I think men has it too, but I think women have a heck of a lot of it. And it's always during periods. And we talked about PMS, but good Lord, I think the men out there is probably going to ask the same question. Well, I have and the director it, there waving the hand and says, yes, great right. question. <laughs> yeah. How does women address mood swings? Why do we have mood swings? And how, how do we actually control the mood swings? Well, mood swings usually happen during perimenopause and menopausal time. Mm -hmm. Mood swings uh, before the period, during the period, they're very light. Sometimes we're overdoing it. With that. <laughs> ah, and okay. it suits us right. Okay. But the hormone, there is hormonal change. So hormonal change creates that mood swings, you know. And actually, we feel like we are not well. We cannot function well. Well, I have a different idea. We can exercise during uh, our period. Uh -huh. We can live a normal life. But... We cannot dress as we like. We cannot take as many showers as we want. We can go We can go swimming, but I would advise you not to, especially right. the first two right. days. Yeah. So some women, though, they have uh, worse mood swings, and I understand that, and that's uh, uh, all uh, related to the hormonal changes that happen. So again, there is things to do for mm -hmm. your mood swings. Discuss it with your doctor. There are some medicine you can take, but don't take advantage of it between us <laughs> girls. <laughs> so don't take advantage of that just because you have mood swings, you blame it on your periods. Yes. Um, now, I do like when you address the fact that there are medical uh, medicine that you can take, but don't rely on it as much. Yes. Correct. It's, uh, I think the more we let our body just be as natural as possible, the best it is for ourselves. I agree 100%. So if you have your mood swings, stay by yourself in your room. See, listen to the music you like, mm -hmm. if you like to music, to listen to music and that relaxes you or get some sleep or read a nice book mm -hmm. 
or call your friend and complain about your partner, your husband, <laughs> about everything that doesn't yeah. go right in life. So you will overcome that. It doesn't last long if there is not a serious reason behind it. Mm, if okay. mood swings go uh, and become severe, then there is an underlying problem. It could be a psychological or psychiatric disorder. Mm -hmm. And then we have to face it by giving medicine, of course. Yeah. So there'll be a different treatment altogether. Yes, exactly. Okay. All exactly. right. Fantastic. Now, we've talked about younger women having periods. We've talked about mood swings and all that. Let's address the older women a little bit. The women that are actually facing menopause. So these types of women are... Um, they no longer have to worry about their periods, they no longer have to worry about their cramps, they no longer have to worry about childbirth. Another group of women that is now not receiving their, their periods. Let's talk about that because I've, I've, I've got surrounding friends right now, we're at that stage where, okay, this is weirder <laughs> than, than when we have our periods. So let's talk about that. Okay. So how, yeah. yeah, what do you think about women with menopause and why, why does women with menopause phases um, what do you call that? Uh, we would have hot the flashes. extreme hot flashes, the uh -huh. sweating, the heat, yeah, the mood swings, also mood yeah. swings, lack massive. of sleep, lack of sleep. They yeah. don't sleep at all. Become overweight. Yes, let's yeah. talk about that. Okay, um, let's go first to perimenopause, mm -hmm. and me perimenopause pre-exists and then we go into menopause. Mm -hmm. And perimenopausal period can last anywhere from a few months to three, four years. Mm. So, and I think we should concentrate more on that period. That, that's where the, the change in hormones happen. And that's where we have physical uh, changes and emotional changes. Mm -hmm. So physical change, like I just mentioned, it could be gain of weight, mm -hmm. um, not able to sleep, mm -hmm. Uh, having hot flushes, um, have going through periods of constipation and diarrhea. Mm -hmm. So a lot of changes in our body, but also emotional. We feel depressed, sad, we feel tired, we don't want to, we lost uh, interest in sex, mm -hmm. uh, we don't feel like doing anything, we don't feel we deserve something, <laughs> and in severe cases they can have suicidal thoughts, but it sounds that, like that's we're, something else. We're pretty messed up at that point. Yeah, we do. Uh, but, you know, hopefully it's not going to take a long time. And then there are things that we can do, natural things, like we can change our food mm -hmm. ethics and our food, uh, the, the kind of food we eat. So we eat a lot of uh, greens. Mm -hmm. We can use soy. Mm -hmm. uh, we can eat cheese cauliflower, broccoli, this type of uh, foods, we can take more vitamins, mm -hmm. vitamin D, vitamin B, uh, start getting omega-3s. The calcium is very important. And let me just uh, open a parenthesis here and mention that we should take care of osteoporosis from our age of 12. Mm -hmm. People think that we need to take care of that when we are in perimenopausal years or menopausal years. No, we have to take care of our calcium uh, storage and um, bone well-being since we are starting mm -hmm. at 12. Mm -hmm. So, But then in perimenopause, our uh, calcium intake is not enough. It's not nearly enough to mm -hmm. our needs, so we have to replenish. So we'll do that by taking vitamins and eating right. Exercising, and then again, smoking is not good. Mm -hmm. Alcohol intake is not good. Try to sleep in a natural way. A lot of doctors prescribe melatonin. I prefer mm -hmm. more organic and natural ways, um, you know, like exercise, exhaust yourself, and then I'm sure you'll go to sleep. Yeah, melatonins, uh, are, I, I, do, I do see that. Uh, cortisol is another one too as well. But how long does this last though? Well, nobody knows. It depends on the person. Mm -hmm. It's different timings. Like I, I mentioned before, it can last a few months, a year, up to four years. We are in menopause if for three or perimenopausal, if for three consecutive months we don't have mm -hmm. our period, mm -hmm. then we can say that we are perimenopausal. Then after six months, we are in menopause. Now, if we go through menopausal time and we don't have our period for a long time and then we have blood, then we have to run, not walk to the doctor, run to our gynecologist because mm -hmm. there is some uh, other uh, underlying reason, underlying perhaps. disorder, yes. Okay. So. And also, a lot of women uh, having very s severe 
perimenopausal problems. We can deal with that with uh, medicine, mm -hmm. and we can prolong the period. We can prolong the perimenopausal time. So there are, there are ways, but uh, mm -hmm. don't think that there is a huge number of women that they are having these severe problems. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, so it's it's normal. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. let's go into a woman who's on full menopause. Okay. And a lot of my friends are saying, how long is this ever going to last? Menopause will last forever. <laughs> <laughs> it's harder in the beginning. The first few years it happens. But <laughs> through our life, the, the rest of our life, we will not have a period. So we will be menopausal forever. So the post-menopause were the, the, the effect of, um, what do you call that? The, 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 the feel, the hotness, the... the the hot flashes the hot and the, flashes and the so depression forth. and all when that. When does that end? I think I think a lot of women wants to know that. Menopause, okay, fine. We're not going to see another period. But what about the effect of that? I'm I sure think... women would love me if I had an answer for them. <laughs> but they I would, don't. It yes. depends on the person. Sometimes uh, it's familial. Sometimes familial. It can last a few months and it can last a couple of years. Right. Uh, I have cases of women going out with a t-shirt in the snow because of the hot flashes. But I always give this advice, girls. Think of snow, think of ice, go to your freezer, get the ice on your hands. It, it works miracles. Okay. Trust me. Thanks for yeah. the tip. I'll make sure there's lots of ice in my closet. Or <laughs> not my closet, but my freezer. <laughs> Fantastic. Now... I'm going to go into an area where you love. Okay. Um, I know we've talked about this many times, even before the show. Is like, I love this area of surgery. So we're going to talk about reconstruction surgery at the intimate area. And I know Dr. Maria is very passionate about that, and she loves to dive into this particular area. So let's, let's dive into aesthetic uh, gynecology. Why okay. do you like it so much? Right. I love it because I love women. And ladies are getting more independent now. They are having careers. Mm -hmm. They take care of themselves on the way they look, the way they dress, and their education. So if we want to look good, mm -hmm. we go and we have our Botox and our fillers. We wear our Chanel's uh -huh. and yep. our nice clothes. Mm -hmm. And ladies care a lot about their intimate area. They want okay. that to look good. Okay, well, let's talk okay, into that. Because you don't mean? walk naked so everybody can see you, but there are times that the person that you care about and so close to you can see you. Mm -hmm. But actually, I tell my patients that I want you to be happy first. Mm -hmm. So anything you do in your body has to be done to make you happy, mm -hmm. not the other person, not mm -hmm. your partner, not your husband. But let, let me... Uh, tell you exactly what is aesthetic gynecology, mm -hmm. because it's not only about beauty and making pretty the intimate area. Mm -hmm. It has to do with a lot of functional problems that we can correct. Mm -hmm. We can also correct problems that you were born with, some abnormalities, anatomic abnormalities. Mm -hmm. Then we have to all agree that after a normal delivery, you might have altered the area. Mm -hmm. You could have... Um, uh, problems during uh, intimacy mm -hmm. and uh, you can have another major problem that we uh, cosmetic gynecologists take uh, take care of it is urinary incontinence that comes from the uh, loosening of the muscles of the vagina mm -hmm. so uh, you have your kids your muscles are getting less uh, tight so you're losing urine when you cough when you laugh and we know, ladies, this is not very comfortable feeling. And uh, we take care of all this. And plus, we can change the color, make it pinkier, make it uh, look like a flower, like <laughs> when you were 20. I'm so excited. <laughs> yeah. I can see that. And yeah. I think all the women would be very excited to, to And, you know, it, it's, it's a subspecialty of gynecology. Mm -hmm. And uh, the downtime for most of the procedures mm -hmm. is minimal. And there is no big surgeries involved usually. Uh, and we have cases that um, women have underwent clitoridectomy, and I really devote a lot of my days and my time to help these women because they never felt uh, intimacy during sex. Oh, they pleasure. never had mm -hmm. pleasure. So uh, this is a very important part of what I am interested in. 
It is a very sad thing. Yes, it is. Um, 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 to be, you know, stripe of the privilege of pleasure. Yes. But at the same time, I do understand that in certain cultures, uh, that is uh, a tradition. Yeah, but when women decide that they want to change that mm -hmm. and they come to me, I feel like it's my obligation to help them as much as I can. And every time I do a surgery to try to find and expose even remnants of their clitoris that was cut off, mm -hmm. I will not stop until I find even a very small piece of tissue. Mm. I'm so obsessed with it because I know as a woman what they've been deprived of. Mm -hmm. And I don't want them to live the rest of their lives uh, with that deprivation in, the, in that part of their life. Most of us remember how nice, pink and fluffy that area down there was. <laughs> and now we can do it with cosmetic gynecology. We have the ways mm -hmm. to uh, rejuvenate and reconstruct that area. Okay, so let's step back a little bit. Now, okay. someone out there is listening to you and goes, I'm really interested in that. Okay. So what is the procedure? What's the first thing that this person have to do? Of course, make an appointment with you, but then... Mm -hmm. And then what would you tell them? What is the procedure like and how long does it take? And tell us everything. Okay. First of all, I have to tell all my patients and the ladies that they're watching us that you have to be realistic mm -hmm. about uh, your wants mm -hmm. in that area. Like you are realistic with your face or your breasts or whatever. So after the gynecologist will take a look, it can suggest what can it be done. Mm -hmm. So you will uh, have that area looking younger and more beautiful. Mm -hmm. We lose a lot of muscle, mm -hmm. especially with uh, body weight changes, mm -hmm. uh, with age, mm -hmm. with deliveries. So there are ways that we can do it, ways with injections, with uh, PRP, with laser, with surgery. We can make it tighter. We can make it lighter. We can make it fuller. So we can have labioplasty, which takes care of the outer part mm -hmm. of our intimate area, the labia, like we call it. Mm -hmm. We can uh, do vaginoplasty, mm -hmm. which is the inner tube, the beginning of our reproductive system. Mm -hmm. So we can make it that tighter. We can also do injections. So it, uh, there are ladies that they don't have the, the, the same pleasure during intercourse, so we can take care of that, besides tightening. Also the outside area uh, and the, the hood in the pubic area, we can make mm -hmm. it back the way it was, more tight, and change the color. Because sometimes it gets darker with age. How do you change the color? Uh, we use laser and different creams. <laughs> It's Ms. Like Belinda, oh this my is my goodness. secret. <laughs> no, it's a secret it's, that it's, you only find out if you see Dr. Maria. <laughs> no, it's, a, it's, wow. um, it's really it's amazing. Fascinating. Yes, it is. It, I'm even fascinated I, myself. You're fascinated. We've been talking about yeah. it. I can tell. I, I, it's great pleasure delivering a baby. Yes. I, I, I feel on the top of the world every time I do that. And it's also exciting and very satisfying when you see your patient being so happy with her intimate area. Ah. So uh, gynecology <laughs> do have a lot of pleasures. <laughs> yes. And uh, aesthetic gynecology, it's not dangerous. Mm -hmm. You don't have to deliver bad news. Right. So it's a part of my work, of my subspecialty that I really love because they're only good things and smiles. Oh, I can I can totally relate why you love it so much. Yeah. Now, I'm going to switch the topic a little bit about uh, freezing eggs. Now, we have mm. a lot of women who is uh, at a stage or at an age right now. It goes, OK, I don't have a partner and I don't intend to have a partner. As you, we talked about, a lot of women are more independent. They're working. They don't have a partner. But I do want to freeze my eggs for in the future if, you know, I'm close to hitting premenopause. Yeah. So that's good thinking. How, what's the benefits? Uh, what's the success rate? How expensive it is? And should a woman consider it? Okay. Um, myself, being a, a gynecologist, being a career woman, being at the age that I am, and mm -hmm. taking into consideration that I delayed mm -hmm. starting my family, mm -hmm. I'm all for it, for egg freezing. But women should educate themselves. Mm -hmm. And like I said before, women, they're becoming independent, having their own careers, so they're starting the family later. Mm -hmm. 
but unfortunately nature doesn't wait until we are ready therefore i believe we start we have to start thinking from a younger age about egg freezing mm -hmm. and the best time to freeze your eggs is just around 30 from 25 to 30 is the best time okay. because your eggs are better mm -hmm. and they're more so i think we should start thinking seriously and do it then of course they say until 35, and I agree. Mm -hmm. And in rare situations, we can freeze eggs at 40. Mm -hmm. But you should mm -hmm. not expect the same results. We right. are having more eggs and better quality the younger you are. Mm -hmm. So if we can say that we can freeze 40 eggs, the, when we defrost them, mm -hmm. in simple words, mm -hmm. they will not all going to be good to use. Mm -hmm. So let's say we're going to get five or six of them. And out of that, the percentage of success, it goes from 18 to 34. Or in some very good IVF centers, it can go up to 40. So mm -hmm. you understand that the, the percentage of getting... So the chances get a yeah. little bit lower when you're older. Mm -hmm. But when you're 25 to 30, I don't think the girls are thinking of freezing eggs at that time. Well, uh, maybe not not on 25, but I do have right. a lot of patients that come to me at 30 and 32 mm. because they realize now I've started. They feel very good with their new job mm -hmm. and their new career. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, OK, for the next seven, eight, ten years, mm -hmm. I want to concentrate and give my all to that. So I will not have kids. Right, so then right. they're thinking, because they're, they're educated, women are educated today, mm -hmm. so they know as we grow older, the chance of getting preg pregnant are less. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we haven't talked m much about it, but infertility is higher nowadays than before, because women, they have endometriosis, they could have problems from... Um, you know, um, toilets, and not that we're not clean, we are, but the bacteria, mm -hmm. uh, it's multiplying easier, especially mm -hmm. in this part with the, with the heat and all that. So if you delay getting pregnant, the chances are getting less. And if you're older in age, then your eggs are not as many as they used to be and they don't have the same quality. So I advise all ladies, if you're serious about having a family later, or even if you're thinking and considering it, I think egg freezing is a good solution. If your eggs are not good, then you have in Europe and United States, mm -hmm. we can have a donor egg, uh, okay. which we don't have here in UAE. But that's, uh, and you can freeze your eggs indefinitely. Indefinitely. There is not a time period that your eggs can remain frozen. Now, I'm going to jump on to ovarian cancer, cervical cancer. Okay. okay. So if and a, a woman find out that she's got ovarian cancer, can she freeze her eggs then? Or it's don't even think about it? Yes. That's what would we... Would it be a good egg or would it be a It would be a egg? great... No, no. Um, well, actually, if it's an ovarian cancer, then mm -hmm. we probably cannot... Uh, freeze the eggs because mm -hmm. they are not of good quality but you can always check them right. we can check the quality of eggs we receive and we can uh, freeze them mm -hmm. but in cervical cancer mm -hmm. cases my advice would be to freeze the eggs if you're at an age that you didn't have uh, any children yet mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you would like to have you have to freeze your eggs uh, you must not you have to you don't have to but I think it's a good choice to do it Good advice. Good advice. Yeah. Um, what are some of the preventions that you can recommend when somebody has a cervical cancer? How did that come about? Is this somebody just, is it genetic? Is that something that they take? Or is it a, something that they don't do or do that they have cervical no, cancer? No, it's, ladies, it's not your fault for getting cervical cancer. Well, actually, we, ha we, we had no idea what was the cause of it years ago. But for the last uh, few years, um, maybe... 30 years to 35, mm -hmm. uh, we discovered that uh, HPV, human papilloma virus, is the highest cause of uh, cervical, cervical cancer. cancer. So what do we have to do? Mm -hmm. Prevention. Mm -hmm. Go regularly and get tested in your gynecologist. 
do your pap smear. The same goes for ovarian cancer, because with the ultrasound and the pap smear, the cervical swab, we can tell and we can diagnose even precancer cases. Mm -hmm. Also, there are some new blood tests, like BRAC1 and 2, mm -hmm. that we should do. You know, Angelina Jolie has done it back in uh, 2012 or yes. 11, and yes. she but went we ahead. We need to share with the audience what did she do, though. Okay. Well, she had uh, this uh, newly then blood test called BRCA1 and BRCA2, BRAC1 and BRAC2. And these tests, they detect the genetic mutations for ovarian cancer and cervical cancer. I advise people that have uh, people in their family, family members that had ovarian cancer or breast cancer or cervical cancer to go have and do it. But I don't think it's necessary to do for the everybody. Mm -hmm. Because there are other tests that uh, cost less, and you can do it, like the pump smear, your ultrasound. There are some cancer markers that can detect, like uh, CA125, CA153, that we can do it uh, in any uh, clinic, in any mm -hmm. environment. It doesn't cost l a lot, and then it will give us uh, a good idea if there is cancer. But um, BRAC1 and 2 will give you, if they're positive, especially BRAC1, mm -hmm. 40 to 50 percent of these people that have a positive BRAC1, they will have cancer. Now, I know that Angelina Jolene actually removed her ovaries, her yes, ovaries yeah. to avoid that. Yeah, because she had her mother that mm -hmm. died from cancer. Right. That's why she did it. Okay. I don't agree with that. So everyone who is scared that she will get cancer, we don't go and remove our uh, breast and we don't remove our ovaries, mm -hmm. okay? Don't overdo mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's good to have a heart-to-heart -heart, uh, conversation with your doctor and give you your chances and the possibility of getting cancer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like I said, there are other ways that uh, can detect cancer and uh, you don't have to go and remove everything. Well, there's a lot of more information uh, publicly now. And, and it's not something that you need to, it's a decision that you shouldn't be making by yourself. Uh, seek a lot of opinions, first opinions, second, third, fourth, fifth, to do a lot of research mm -hmm. before you make that decision. Because I think it's pretty dramatic it to is. remove something out of your body that's naturally supposed to be there. Once you remove it, you cannot put it back. That's so true. That's so true. <laughs> it's done. Yeah. Yeah. So let's. This question came about to me, and 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 a lot of the ladies would like to know this is uh, PCOS. Mm, right. That. I mean, gynecology is huge. <laughs> I mean, I can talk for days. Now, before you go into PCOS and just explaining what that is, let me just kind of touch on what it means. It just means a condition that the ovaries produced an abnormal amount of androgen which is the male sex hormones. <laughs> yes, we do have them, but very little bits. But then in our case, it's, uh, it's described as a numerous small cyst, which is uh, sex and it's on an ovary. So it actually <laughs> stops, or it, um, stops, ovulation. stops ovulation. Mm -hmm. So what are your thoughts on that? We can have polycystic ovaries, mm -hmm. but not necessarily have the syndrome. Mm -hmm. Syndrome has to be verified by abnormal hormones. Mm -hmm where women can have polycystic ovaries and we can see them in the ultrasound and we can treat them in both cases, either if it's a simple polycystic ovaries or it's a syndrome. And we can detect that uh, with numerous ways. I mean, women, they either have pain in the lower abdomen, mm -hmm. they see weight changes, mm -hmm. mood changes, mm -hmm. they see hair, Mm -hmm. in their face, around the nipple, in the breast, in the abdomen. Mm -hmm. So they are getting worried about that and they mm -hmm. go to the doctor. But we can have ovarian cysts, uh, like small cysts that they become big, mm -hmm. containing fluid, usually uh, blood, in uh, young ages, as young as 11 or 12 year old. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have this amazing test, which is called the ultrasound and we can detect, we can see, we can measure even every little cyst that we have in the ovaries and we do have 
treatment for that. Good. We do have. Good. It's the pill. It's, it's the it's a pill. pill that we take for prevention of pregnancy, the same or similar to that pill that um, help us with polycystic because polycystic ovaries don't allow ovulation. So if you are in uh, the time in your life that you want to start a family, you have to take care of your polycystic ovaries. Can you, can you get pregnant having polycystic ovaries? Yes, but there is a small percentage of ladies that get pregnant having a lot of cysts in their ovaries because ovulation doesn't happen, mm -hmm. because the, the cysts, they're blocking your good eggs from coming out of the ovary and going fertilized and getting fertilized. So I think it's something that all ladies uh, should check when you go for your checkup to do your pap smear, you ask your gynecologist, check your ovaries, especially if you're in the reproducing age, mm -hmm. but even earlier, how happy you get when you leave your, excuse me, your gynecologist office and you got the reassurance that everything is okay. You go out with a big smile and I'm sure you're, you're happy and ready to go on and live your life, even though you don't wear shopping bags. You don't uh, hold shopping bags that we <laughs> like to do. So health is more important than everything. I'm sure we all agree on that. I mean, as a woman, we endure what puberty and then um, um, pregnancy, childbirth, um, the changes of the whole body Hormone. itself, and then you going through menopause and yeah. pre and post. So I think the woman's body is is has gone through a lot in its lifetime itself. So I'm not surprised that it would affect um, our mental thinking, uh, how we believe in ourselves, and how we treat ourselves. So. Uh, today, we've learned so much from you, Dr. Maria, but I would love you to um, kind of share your last thoughts is what do you want the audience to uh, to take away from this particular session? Okay, if there is one thing that I want all of you ladies to take away is prevention. Like Miss Lee mentioned just a minute ago, we are very complex. There are a lot of things that have to work right to be able to be uh, fertile and reproduce and live a normal life without mood swings, without hot flashes, without anything. But to do that, we have to practice prevention. When you go to your dentist to have your teeth clean, when you go to have a full blood uh, checkup, do the same with your gynecologist. It takes five minutes and it saves life. Think about it, it's not painful, it doesn't take a day, it's only five to 10 minutes the visit to the gynecologist and saves lives. And something else that I want to stress is breast prevention, breast cancer prevention. We have the wrong idea about breast cancer. A lot of women think that breast cancer is the top um, cause for um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. death and it's breast not. cancer. Actually, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's cardiovascular disorder. Right. So first, we have to be happy. <laughs> eat right and be happy, and then is breast cancer. But uh, because it's uh, debilitating, we have uh, to have a surgery in most cases, remove our breasts and have chemotherapies and stuff. All I'm asking you to do once a month, not even once a week. When you take a shower, mm -hmm. just palpate your breast. And even if you feel the smallest lump there, bump or whatever, just pay a visit, the five minute visit to your gynecologist. Ultrasound can detect any mm -hmm. uh, problem that you have, any abnormality in your breast. It's non-painful. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have um, uh, radiation. Mm -hmm. Or you can even go for a mam mammogram. But I found ultrasound much easier. So prevention for your breast, prevention for down there to be clean. So you would do a swab, we do the pap smear, mm -hmm. we make an ultrasound, see that your uterus, your ovaries are okay, and off you go and enjoy life. So prevention is the main thing that I want to uh, uh, tell all ladies to do. Mm -hmm. If one thing they will take away, that's what I want to stress fantastic. most of it. That's fantastic. Well, ladies out there who's listening, prevention is your best medicine. And make sure that you prevent, prevent, prevent. It's always good to be precaution, then to wait to the last minute and to deal with the problem. 
So thank you so much today for watching Spotlight and for joining us. My name is Belinda and this particular show is broadcast on social media and on Asira Academy. So I also want to thank you, Asira, for actually sponsoring the show. Thank you for watching again. And I look forward to seeing you at the next Spotlight when we have an, another amazing story of a fabulous woman. I'm Dr. Maria Nicolopoulou, obstetrician, gynecologist, and cosmetic gynecology specialist, and I'm spotlighted by Miss Belinda Lee.